All right, I'm going to hit you with this uh, kind of scary chart right off the bat. Uh, we're going to learn kind of what this means uh, over the next four-ish lectures. Um, what this is is the type hierarchy in Scala, and all these arrows mean that each type inherits another type. Inherits, it's a brand new word. Let's figure out what that word means. Uh, but for now, before you really know what that means, all these values over here, the ones that I kind of called primitives, and we did actually add string to that list. Strings technically work really strange. Um, but all these ones that inherit from any val are the ones that I've been calling primitives. All of these, their values go directly on the stack. Everything that inherits from any ref, which is any class that you write, is going to be only a reference to them is going to be stored on the heap. And there will be objects in the heap. And on the stack, we'll just have references to those objects. So this chart will make a little bit more sense towards the end of the lecture, hopefully anyway. Are any value just in the stack? Yeah, all these ones. So whenever you have an int, if you just, in your main method, you say val x of type int equals 7, it's going right on the stack. The heap doesn't even get involved. So anything on the any val side is going right on the stack. Everything on the any ref side, which is everything, you know, this is a very limited view. It's literally everything else is on the any ref side. Everything else, including every class you write, every class that's not any one of these, it's all on the any ref side. And they're going on the heap, and they're always passed by reference. Uh, we only have references on the stack to them. So what does that mean to extend, inherit? What do, what do these words mean? That's what we want to talk about today. We want to plant the seeds of your understanding of inheritance. And then on Wednesday, it's examples. We're going to go to the memory diagram on Wednesday and show how all this looks in memory. And then we're going to jump into polymorphism, a topic that we can't talk about until we learn inheritance. So let's learn inheritance. We're going to start with some, uh, um, some motivation, some ramp up and stuff. Uh, before we talk about inheritance proper. So let's give this an example. I think the best way to talk about this topic is through an example. So let's suppose that we're building a fairly simple game, a game that could get complex if we build out the whole thing. We're not going to. We're, we're not going to build out this full game. Uh, but we're going to look at the structure of some of the components and some of the features today and talk about how we would build those and how we would represent those in the code. Uh, and things that we can do with the setup that we're doing. Uh, and by the way, OOP in general, these three weeks, it's all about when our programs get big, how do we organize our code in a meaningful way that helps us write programs that aren't completely messy, mess of uh, a code base, and also code that's easy to maintain, which means if we want to add a new feature to this game, we build this game that's described here, then we want to add a new feature to it. How do we build our code in a way that makes that as easy as possible is what we want to do. So for this game, we're going to have a, a 2D top-down. We'll never actually see the game, by the way. We're just going to build some code with this in mind. A 2D top-down view where players can have some location in this 2D space. Each player is going to have some health points and a strength stat. Players are going to have, uh, be able to pick up dodgeballs and throw them at each other. And depending on that player's strength, uh, the other player being hit by one of their dodgeballs is going to lose a certain amount of health, and they can collect health potions to regain some of their health. So we have two types of objects and players that can navigate this game world, and we want to figure out how to build something like this. And of course, using OP and inheritance. Yeah, any veil on the stack, any ref on the heap. So we need these three different types of objects in the game. And I'm even going to back up to last week's content and do a little bit of a review here of why we even talk about classes when we want objects. Uh, for this, we're going to need, uh, I'm not going to talk about this class today except for this one slide, so I want to make sure, uh, make sure it's out there. I'm going to be using this physics vector class. It's in the repo, but I didn't put it on the slides outside of this slide. Uh, but I will use it throughout this lecture. Physics vector, it's going to be a three-dimensional vector with default values of 0, 0, 0. 
And this is how we're going to store objects' locations in this game. I'm using this syntax for default values. This is something handy if you want to use this in your assignments. It's a very handy thing to do in certain cases. I'm going to say this variable has a default value of 0. All three of them do. So if that parameter is absent, if I don't provide that parameter, when I call the constructor, it's going to be 0. So for example, if I say new physics vector of 2, x is 2, negative 2, y is negative 2, and then I never provided a z, z is just going to get its default value of 0, and that physics vector will be 2, negative 2, 0. So I'm using a 3D vector, uh, but we want a 2D game. So I'm usually only going to give this the x and y coordinates, uh, which is a common thing to do. We usually use 3D game engines these days just because they're already built. They have all kinds of nice features and everything, even if we're building a 2D game. You know, so a lot of your 2D games are built on 3D engines. Uh, so we're doing the same thing here um, because there was, it seems like long ago now, there was a programming assignment where you would build a 3D gaming engine. And then I just used that gaming engine in this lecture example. Is a question? Uh, so if you wanted to not provide, let's say, the second, would it just be a comma, like a, a comma space? So if you don't want to provide the negative two, I'm saying if you're so, something, like how would you? So if you don't want to, so you can only use the default values for the last parameters. So I can just provide, I can provide nothing and get zero, zero, zero. I can provide just x, I can provide just x and y, or just x, or all x, y, and z, but I can't skip x or skip y and go to the other one. So the order is preserved and order does matter here. Unfortunately, we can't just skip a middle one. So if we just want to specify x and y and take the default, or x and z and take the default y, unfortunately, just no way to do that in Scala. Or, well, not with this syntax, I'll say. Is it common to have a class with nothing in the bracket, the braces that follow? Uh, yeah, sometimes. Uh, so I have no, so I'm only using this class to store x, y, and z. I could add more state and more behavior. And the actual class in the repo, I, I forget if I deleted it or not. I forget what the state of it is right now. Uh, I believe does have a two-string method in it. Uh, so we can add more to this to give it more functionality. But when we have a class that's just made to store some values, and those values are specified in the constructor, it's fairly common to have an empty body to a class. It's perfectly valid, perfectly legal code, and it does what we want it to do. This physics vector, it's just made to represent a 3D vector. I don't need to do anything else. Uh, but again, in the repo, I think I have a two string, so when you print it out, it actually gives you like vector notation, parentheses, and then comma separated values for x, y, and z. Yeah, sometimes is my official answer. Yeah, and this is a custom class. Uh, the reason I don't call it vector is because there's an internal vector in Scala. And when I called it vector, a lot of students accidentally imported the internal vector and had all kinds of errors in it. So I just had to name it something that doesn't conflict with something that's already named. Question? This class, you able to change those values right? Yeah, so if I did val physics, uh, val vector equals new vector, I would do vector.x equals 5, and I could change those because I declared these as vars. Oh. What's the difference between objects and class? That's what we want to talk about right now. So we have three different object types that we want in our code. But say, and we know, uh, just to foreshadow a bit, we know that if we wanted to find a new type, we're going to use a class. I mean, I, I say we know that, but you only heard of that for the first time a week ago. So uh, it's pr still fresh in your minds. It's still, uh, it still hasn't solidified um, too much yet, possibly. Uh, so say we represented these as objects instead. What would be the danger here? So let me define an object player just like we did in LO1. We're defining an object player. We want its location. We want some orientation, which is what direction the player is facing. So when they throw a dodgeball, I know where that dodgeball should be going, what its velocity should be, the direction of its velocity. Health and max health, its uh, strength stat, 
And then two methods, when it uses a dodgeball and when, it uses, when the player uses a dodgeball and when the player uses a health potion, what should that do? We'll likewise need a dodgeball class. A lot of this stuff is just what I decided to put in these classes, by the way. Uh, the, this is one lecture where the state and behavior, the details, less relevant than the overall topic of when we get to inheritance. Um, so I just had to get some interesting stuff in these things. Uh, dodgeball is going to need a location, a velocity, because these dodgeballs will be moving through this space after they're thrown. So I want to know which direction they're moving. This dodgeball happens to not be moving at all. Uh, a mass, I want to know the mass, and that combined with the velocity is going to give me the momentum behind that thing so I can know when it collides with the player how much damage should be done to that player. Uh, we don't build that functionality, but that's where we would be going with all this, all this information. And whenever a player uses a dodgeball, in the player class we just deferred to the dodgeball. We said call the dodgeballs use method on this player. In the dodgeball class, when a player uses this dodgeball, we're going to set its velocity equal to the player's, the direction of the player's orientation and at a magnitude <coughs> linear with the player's strength. So whatever the player's facing and however much strength they have, that's where we're going to determine where this dodgeball is going to go and how fast it's going to go there. And finally, health potion. I'm going to want a location, not necessarily a velocity. I mean, we could throw potions. Uh, and by the end of this lecture, we'll have that functionality. Um, but in a volume, how big is this potion? And when a player drinks this potion, I want them to heal the amount of volume. We're going to say it's a one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, the amount of volume, whatever unit we're using, is going to be the amount of hit points that are restored when this health potion is used up to the player's max health. And I'm going to use this convenient min method here. Uh, this this uh, syntax might seem a little strange at first. Remember, every value in Scala is an object. Every object has state and behavior. This player health, their current health, plus the volume of this health potion, that's what they're going to heal up to. This is just an int. Bam. Hit parentheses right there. That's an int inside those parentheses. What's inside the parentheses resolves to an int. An int is a value, therefore it's an object, therefore it has state and behavior. Some of the behavior of an int is a method named min, which is going to take another int and return the minimum of the two. So I'm calling the min method of the int class, giving it the player's max health and getting the min. So if they were near full health or full health already and drank a health potion, I don't want their HP to go over their max HP. And it's going to take the min of whatever they healed up to and their max HP. All right, so we got three objects defined. But what's the big problem here? Right, well, obviously, it's on the, the screen here. But, but there's a big problem here is that when we use objects, we can only have one instance of each. We're defining one player, we're defining one dodgeball, we're defining one health potion. We defined objects directly. <coughs> this will work. This will kind of work for us, but this is a very boring game. We can only have one health potion in the game, we can only have one dodgeball in the game, but most importantly, we can only have one player in the game. What are you going to do, throw a dodgeball up in the air and try to hit yourself? Like, what's the point of this game if there's only one player? Dodgeball is inherently a two-player, uh, multiplayer game. Uh, so very boring. Very boring game. But we could get this to work. But that's why we use classes. We use classes so we can define multiple objects of the same type. We're not defining a player object. We're defining a player type which we can use to create multiple players and finally have our multiplayer game. We can say new player, new player, new player, and have a three-player game. Have three players in the game with different locations. Uh, they can all have different values for player location, and they can move around with different velocities. They can have different stats, different HP, because they all have their own copies of all the state variables 
not just one object with all these state variables. So with, as classes, we're going to rewrite those objects as classes so we can use the new keyword and create multiple objects of this type. And when we do that, we're going to think of all of the state and decide which state variables we want to be able to initialize when an object is created. So whenever we create a brand new player object, whatever state we want to initialize that might change between player to player, we want to put those values in the constructor. So when I create a player, the location of the player, I might want to spawn players at different locations, put that in the constructor. The orientation, they might be facing different directions when they spawn in. If I'm spawning them on opposite ends of the map, I probably want them facing each other initially. If this, guy's, uh, this player is facing a wall and this player is facing the, the game map, uh, it's not going to be very interesting for this player. So we want to adjust that based on how they spawn in. Orientation, set it in the constructor. Max health, I don't know, maybe everybody has the same max health, or maybe I have some leveling system that persists across matches. I'm going to say I'm going to create that max health, set that in the constructor. And strength, each player might have different strength sets, and based on their classes. Maybe they chose a different class with different max HP and different strength. Somebody's a tank, somebody's a, a ranger, I don't know. Uh, I might have those set in the constructor because they might change. The one thing that won't change is their health. Their starting health is always going to be initialized to their max health. They can't change that, so I'm not going to put health in the constructor because it wouldn't make sense to say, I'm going to create this player at half health. Uh, I'm, I'm just not going to do that in my game. So this state variable is declared outside of the constructor because I don't want whoever's constructing a new object of this type to be able to set that variable to whatever they want. There's a very fixed predetermined thing. Health is going to be, their current health is going to be set to their max hit points initially when, it's construct, when this object's constructed. So just leave that be outside of the constructor. And the state stays there, the behavior stays the same. Dodgeball, same thing. But now all of, all of the state, we want to initialize the location, the velocity, the mass. Uh, we could argue that velocity should always be initialized to 0, 0. You could win that and then take that out of the constructor. That's fine. Uh, I put all three of them in the constructor. <coughs> and a health potion, same thing. The potion location, volume. I want potions in different locations, of course. I want potions with different volume. I'm going to put both of those values in the constructor. Is there a way to make Vale Health either accessible or not accessible from outside? Ooh. That's a good question. I thought I was going to have a quick answer for you. I don't know. I don't have an answer for you. If it's in the constructor, you, you would just delete val or var, and then you can't access it from outside. Since we're declaring it outside of the constructor, um, I don't think we do have a way to do that in Scala. I think it has to be accessible from outside. Um, but I'm not 100% sure on that. So I'll give a, a strong maybe. I don't think you can restrict access to it. There is a private keyword. I always forget that uh, access modifiers exist in Scala. The community never uses them. Scala devs just don't use them. OK. So private is part of the, the language. We would do that then. Can we delete objects? Kind of. So if you, uh, do I want to go down this, uh, this road? Uh, I don't think you can ever manually delete them, but they will be deleted if you can no longer access them. So if you lose all your references to an object, it'll, they'll get garbage collected, which means the JVM is going to go in and delete those objects. Since you have no way of accessing them, it's going to use, do that to free up memory, which is a very handy feature of Scala that you're going to miss in 220 moving to C. Uh, but 220 is all about, uh, a huge topic is memory management, doing those things on your own, uh, which is why C is chosen for that class. Uh, but you don't get that feature in C, so you'll really figure out what that means in 220. In 116, we have garbage collection, which means you don't have to think about cleaning up your memory and memory leaks and things like that. Uh, so you can delete an object just by deleting all references to it. 
So now with our class, we have a class dodgeball, and then we create new objects of type dodgeball, saying new dodgeball, and then give it the constructor parameters. Where do you want this dodgeball to be? How fast do you want it to be moving, in what direction, and what do you want its mass to be? You can specify for each dodgeball different parameters for its constructor to set its initial values to different values. So here we created two dodgeballs on the heap at different memory locations with different state variables, their own copies of the state variables. And then on the stack, dodgeball1 and dodgeball2 only store references to those objects that are on the heap. I'll show the whole memory diagram with inheritance uh, on Wednesday to make that one more clear. Uh, today's more conceptual. But now we're ready to really talk about inheritance. So that was all review of, of last week. Hopefully none of that was too, uh, too wild at this point, uh, your fourth time hearing that stuff. But uh, inheritance is the brand new thing. So as we go through that, we'll notice that dodgeball and health potion had a lot of common state and behavior. So they both have a location and they both have a use method. I guess I shouldn't say a lot, but uh, they both have a location and a use method that takes a reference to a player and returns a unit. So they have similar state, similar behavior. And if we're creating this game, it's going to start getting tedious at some point to maintain these two classes separately. So if we have these two classes and we want to add more functionality that should apply to both of these objects, we're going to have to start writing them in both classes. For example, we want uh, a mass method that for dodgeball will return the mass. And for health potion, it will compute the mass dependent on its volume. We could have some kind of duplicate functionality across these. Um, and especially like momentum, we want to compute the momentum of a dodgeball, mass times velocity. On the slide right now, we don't have any velocity on a, health, on a health potion. But if we do add that functionality, we want health potions to be able to move through our game and have the game's physics engine move these uh, potions around and have potions have velocity. We could then compute the momentum. But we'd have to write that momentum method in both of these, have all this math copied and pasted in both objects. And what if we want something like when these things hit the ground? A health potion should shatter. A dodgeball should bounce. We have some common, similar functionality that can happen between these two classes. And that's where we're going to use inheritance. We're going to factor out anything that's common between these two, any common state and behavior, and put all that common state and behavior factored out into another class. And then health potion and dodgeball are going to inherit from that class. They're going to steal all that behavior, state and behavior from this new class, this game object class. It's going to uh, inherit from it by extending this class. It's going to take this class and add more stuff to it. That's what we want to do, and that is inheritance, when we inherit from another class. Uh, and I'm going to add that object mass. We are going to do that computing the mass of a potion based on its velocity. We'll implement that functionality. So this new class, this abstract class that we're going to call it, this abstract class is going to contain all the common state and behavior between these two classes. So I'm going to define it using abstract, the abstract keyword, an abstract class, which means this is a class that just has partial functionality that's shared between multiple other classes. And we're just factoring out that common functionality into the abstract class. We have the location as a physics vector. And we have two methods, object mass and use, which takes an instance of a player. Now, this is common behavior between dodgeball and health potion, but Dodgeball and health potion do different things when these methods are called. 
a player using either object uh, is going to have very different, uh, very different functionality. Very different things are going to happen depending on which type was actually used. So we're not going to define the method in the abstract class. We're going to define these as abstract methods. These are methods that have no definition. There's no body, there's no braces here. That makes these methods abstract, which means they don't really exist. We're just defining what the method name, parameters, and return type are. So we're saying there will be some method named object mass that takes no parameters and returns double. It will exist at some point. For now, we're just going to say it will exist, but it's just some abstract concept. It's some thought that this class had. And somewhere down the road, Dodgeball and Health Potion are going to implement the functionality of what these methods should do when they're called on either a Dodgeball or a Health Potion. So we have our abstract class, and when we want to inherit from this abstract class, we're going to use the extends keyword with notation like this. I have my class dodgeball with its constructor that we've seen before, and then right after the dodgeball's constructor extends, and then the class we're extending. Once we have this, dodgeball is gaining all of the state and behavior of this class. So dodgeball has a state variable named object location now. It has a method named object mass. It has a method named use that takes a player, reference to a player. Now most of that is kind of useless. I mean, we had, these don't have any definition and we already had a location, uh, but I promise this will pay off eventually <laughs> using inheritance. Uh, when we extend an, a, when we extend a class, which we can extend classes that are not abstract, but in this class I'm just going to show you extending abstract classes for the most part anyway. When we extend an abstract class, we have to call its constructor in the constructor of the extending class. And we have a little bit of vocab here. This is called the parent class, and this is the child class, or this is the abstract class, and this is the concrete class. So a little vocab. I, I, I hate getting caught up on vocab. Uh, it's a lot to memorize if you're, you're uh, caught up on that stuff. So, um, But if you hear me saying those things, that's what I mean. Yeah. Uh, can you explain what DB location does? DB location? So this is going to be the, the dodgeball location. It'll be where this dodgeball is in the game world. <clears throat> so extends and then call the constructor of the class you're <coughs> extending. Now the only variables we have access to are the variables from the dodgeball constructor. So we're going to use these variables and pass them on to the game objects constructor. So now we're calling the game object constructor where object location is equal to db location and db location came from the constructor call. If you're reusing variable names across your inheritance like this, so say instead of db location, object location, I did what I did last semester, which is really confusing. Just use location and location and location. If you're reusing variable names, only one of them can be declared using valor var, and that will be the one that's available to the public. If somebody outside of these classes says dot location, it would be whatever one is declared with valor var that will be accessed. If none of them are declared with valor var, like which is the case here, uh, they just won't be able to access it at all. Our solution this semester, because I've gotten wiser and Paul and I talked about it for a while, is we're just not going to reuse variable names. Just don't do it. 
So I'm going to call this dodgeball location and object location. And later on in these slides, we're going to see another one that will be a var, which will be just location. We're just not going to reuse variable names across constructors because it gets confusing as hell. The way Scala handles that, uh, Paul and I talked about it for a while. I still don't understand how the hell it works. There's multiple variables with the same name, and there's really complex scoping yeah. rules that apply. We're just going to avoid it. Yeah. Uh, where would you define the location? Would it be like inside the dot? Like, would it be inside the class or the abstract class? The, the location itself, like when we do var location? Yeah. Uh, so that's going to come up later in the slides. Game object is actually going to extend another class, which is going to define location when we get there. And then that's the one that we'll use for, for the actual location. And these other ones, these other named locations, are just going to be like transitory variables to just send it that value, that vector, to the next constructor. This is going to be sent to the next constructor. And then the last constructor in the chain is going to say var location, and that's the location we actually want. And that's the only one we'll end up using. So unless you want to be very confused, uh, we, I got away with it the last like th two, three years. Uh, but it, it has the potential to cause a lot of confusion. If you want to avoid that potential, just don't reuse your variable names. Uh, I usually get away with it because they're all passed by reference and all the variables are referring to the same object. So even if you ignore scoping rules completely, uh, it doesn't matter which variable is being accessed because they refer to the same object. So I kind of got away with it, but if you don't want to risk it, just don't reuse those variable names. Because uh, those scoping rules, I don't want to go through slides on. It's, it's just a lot. Uh, I, inheritance alone is confusing enough. This is going to take enough time uh, to really let this breathe and digest. Uh, we don't want to talk about those scoping rules. Now, when we implement these methods, so our abstract class said, you're going to have these two methods. If you extend me, you better implement these two methods. So when we do, we're going to use the keyword override. Before somebody asks, technically, it's optional. If you just did def object mass, um, it would still work here in this case. Um, but we're going to use the keyword override to say we're overriding behavior defined in a class that we extended. And we're, whatever this was defined as, which happened to be nothing in this case, whatever it was defined as, replace that definition with this definition. So we can have concrete, what we call concrete methods, methods with implementations, which every method you've ever seen so far has been a concrete method. We can have concrete methods here. We can say equals and then some definition. And if we do that, when we say override, we're saying, Get rid of that old definition and replace it with this. <clears throat> when, when it's a dodgeball and you ask for the object mass of a dodgeball, do this. I don't care what game object has to say about it, do this. Same thing with use. We're going to override the use from the class that we extended or inherited from and replace it with this definition. Now, you'll, you'll get away with out override here. Because there's no definition to override, we're just implementing it for the first time. So you will get away with it. Uh, I will still use the keyword override, and I recommend you do too. If you don't have the keyword override here, and you have like one typo in this use, you put uh, or object mass, maybe you have a lowercase m. Very common mistake. Lowercase m in object mass, and you don't have your keyword override, you're not going to find that out. It's going to be hard to find that out. If you use override and you have a lowercase m here, IntelliJ is going to say, you told me you're overriding, but you're, I don't know what you're over. You're not overriding anything. There's no object mass with a lowercase m over here. Fix your stuff. So have, putting the keyword override is giving the compiler, letting the compiler know your intentions so the compiler can work for you and find your mistakes so you can fix them before they become large mistakes. Find that capitalization error before it becomes this huge debugging nightmare 
that you're trying to figure out right before the deadline. Uh, same, the, the, similar to using this. This dot, it's usually optional, but if you put it there, let the compiler know your intentions and the compiler can work for you. Plus, it's just more clear to other developers reading your code. When you start working on Teams, it'll be more clear what your intentions were. Instead of just relying on the, your understanding of the scoping rules. So you make one mistake in your understanding and you got the wrong stuff going on. So in each inheriting class, we're going to define the abstract methods. And we have to define these. Oh, jeez, after that long talk, I didn't put my override right there. Crikey. Uh, <laughs> uh, I should have put that there. One, uh, one typo there, and I'd be screwed. Um, that means it's like that in the repo, too? Oh, jeez. Uh, so we have to implement these abstract methods. We have to give them definitions before somebody calls these methods. If somebody tries to call these methods and there's no definition, what happens? Things break. Uh, so we have to define these methods. With the abstract class, the abstract class doesn't have these methods defined. So what happens if somebody creates a new game object and then says game object dot object mass? What should be returned? I don't know. The answer is you can't create a new instance of an abstract class. If you have an abstract class and you say new game object, it's not allowed. You just can't do it. Can't create instances of abstract classes because of that question. Like, what, what would happen when these methods are called? Well, there's no definition. Nothing happens. Or maybe something happens. Should it break? Should it be an error? I don't know. It's just not allowed. Abstract class can't create objects of that type. Not directly, anyway. You have to extend, implement the missing behavior, and then create new objects of those types. And that's how we use the abstract classes. All right, any questions so far? Was everything answered in the chat? Okay. My phone fell asleep and I couldn't see the chat for a little bit there. So like when object mass, the abstract class is going to say there will be a method named object mass that returns a double if you inherit this class. And then each inheriting class is going to actually provide the definition. They do different things. So the object mass method is going to do different things whether you got yourself a health potion or you got yourself a dodgeball. All right, but why? So far, we, we went through all this work of inheritance. We created an abstract class, factored out common state and behavior. Uh, we didn't implement anything in that abstract class. We didn't do anything in it. We just said, here's two methods that you have to define, and you're going to have some location thing. We got back to the same behavior we were at at the end of our discussion about classes and objects. But we did a lot more work, and we created an extra file in our project. Uh, why did we do all this? So there's a lot of answers why. I'll, I'll foreshadow the best answer is polymorphism, which we have to wait till Friday to talk about. Uh, but with inheritance alone, there's still some good reasons. What if we want to add more behavior to every game object, every health potion and, uh, and dodgeball? We want to add functionality to both classes simultaneously. Well, in the past, in the long past days of last week, we would have to write that method in both classes. We'd have two big chunks of the same code, and we'd have to maintain that code as we go forward with our project. If we want to make a change here, if we make a copy-paste error or anything, things, things just get messy. So instead, we just put that method in the abstract class. Both types, dodgeball and health potion, extend this class. They both inherit all the state and behavior from this class. So let's define a method that's not abstract. Let's actually give this method its full behavior and then let both classes inherit this behavior. Both extending classes can inherit this behavior. 
So now this close to player, we're going to do some math. We're going to check if this player is close within 0.5 units to, uh, this, uh, to this game object. We can call this on health potions and dodgeballs now. They both just get this behavior. They inherit this behavior. Now with just two classes, okay, you know, we could have cut and pasted this twice and not had to think about inheritance, this new syntax, this new stuff. Um, not too bad. But there's a good chance that if we're building this game, we release this game to user base and they start loving it, they're drinking health potions, they're throwing dodgeballs, they're going to want a third object type. They're going to want something else. They're going to want to set traps on the ground for other, other opponents. They're going to want bow and arrows. They're going to want something else in this game. And you're going to want to create, keep adding more and more objects. We want to extend the functionality of this game and keep releasing new features. Well, no big deal. We create a new object, extends game object, and whatever we put in here, it already has all of that state and behavior. And then in that object's class itself, we just add the functionality that's specific to that type. We add, we add traps. Okay, they already have a close to player method. They already uh, have an, a location. We just add the functionality that's pertinent to that object type. But there's more. So suppose we had a large physics engine that you wrote for homework one that we used to write for homework one, a physics engine that works in 3D space and updates the world and uh, applies gravity, detects collisions, and then tell, notifies those objects that there was a collision and tells it to do whatever it does. Suppose we had this whole physics engine that does all this fun physics stuff that you want to do in games. <coughs> And it works through a physics object class. So the physics engine takes physics objects and then applies physics to them. So anything that is a physics object can have physics applied to it through the physics engine. But we have game objects, so that doesn't help us. Well, no big deal. We're going to have game object, extend physics object, call its constructor, and now every single game object in our game is a physics engine. When we extend, we actually have it, uh, what we call an is a relationship. Dodgeballs, a dodgeball is a game object. A po health potion is a game object. And by the transitive property, a health potion is a physics object. A dodgeball is a physics object. So dodgeballs and health potions through not even a line of code, like a partial line of code, now can interact with the physics engine. Yeah. Well, the parent class for a game object would be a physics object, right? Yeah. Yeah. So game object is a physics object, and it's transitive too. So dodgeball is a game object. Game object is a physics object. Therefore, dodgeball is a physics object. Can you say that again, but slower. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so a game object, since a game object extends the physics object class, that means that it's going to inherit that class. This is where we get the term inheritance. And this creates what's called an is a relationship. So a game object is a physics object. So if I have a game object somewhere in my game, in reality, that is a physics object in addition to being a game object. So a health potion is a health potion. It's also a game object. It's also a physics engine. It's similar to like a square is a rectangle. It's the same kind of relation as that. Uh, where a square is a square and a rectangle, a game object is a game object and a physics object. Yeah. So what exactly is the role of object location right there after game object uh, before physics vector? This object location? Uh, this is uh, just a, and for our purposes here, it's just a transitive variable. So when we call the constructor for a dodgeball or a health potion, we're going to give it its specific uh, location variable, and we're just going to forward that over to the game objects constructor, which is then just going to forward it to the physics object constructor. 
And then physics object, that's the one that actually cares. This is where we get our var, var location. This is the location that's actually going to matter the way I had this set up. So then in game object, we did this dot location. We're accessing this location. And that object location doesn't get used directly. I could do this dot object location right here because it refers to the same physics vector. So I'll get the same values if I did it that way. Uh, but to be consistent, I'll just stick with uh, dot location all the time. In this close to player, if we want all of our inheriting objects to use that method, we just don't override it. But if we have some object that wants a different implementation, you can override it and implement it however you want. Maybe traps want to detect close to player with a different threshold or something. We would override that. And now we extend physics object, and our physics engine applies to all these objects, all health potions, all dodgeballs. So our inheritance structure has expanded a bit. So when we draw these out, or at least when I do in, in the few lectures where I'll, I'll actually draw these out, I'll, go, I'll switch to memory diagrams again in future lectures. But our, we have arrows pointing to indicate the ISA relationships, the inheritance. A dodgeball extends game object, which extends physics objects, object. And we'll draw it out like this, um, typically in what's called a UML diagram. Not big on the diagrams, to be honest. But that's how we can make sense of this picture. So this is all inheritance. Double, float, long, et cetera, all extend any veil. Any veil extends any. And the type any veil, the functionality of that says anything of this type is going directly on the stack as a value. It's, an, it's any value. It's going right on the stack as a value. And anything that extends any ref, list, option, map, array, any class that you ever write ever that doesn't explicitly extend something, which includes our physics object, the end of our inheritance chain, implicitly extends any ref, which means we're going to store those things on the, those objects on the heap, and on the stack is only going to be a reference to that object. I didn't realize how late it was. Let's, uh, let's get this lecture question, and then once you submit that, you can go. Uh, see everyone Wednesday. Have a great day.